Hey everybody, what's going on? It's your boy BQ here with Ro the Great, aka Ro the Grinder, aka Ro the Grappler, aka Ro the Gremlin, aka Ro the Grizzly, aka Ro the Grandest, aka Ro the Grandson, aka Ro the Grand Champion. What's up, man? Wow, that's a lot of AKAs, man. Hell yeah. <laughs> I had to hook I'm you. good though, man. Yeah, man. I had... to do this with you. Hell yeah, I had to hook you up this week, man. Um, Adam is on vacation in Mexico for a couple weeks, so I'm stepping in um returning to the scene of the crime to talk impact with roe and if you guys didn't catch my live impact chat i did on the channel right after impact the other night i'm gonna do my best to do that every single week work schedule permitting if not you know i might try to do it the next day or whatever so if you want to make sure you're a part of that click the little bell if you're listening on youtube right now next to the subscribe button make sure you get all the notifications and uh so yeah, we're going to talk impact, but uh, let's get into a few other things real quick. Uh, if you have not listened to my interview with Alicia, uh, the newest hiring to the Impact Wrestling Broadcast Team or Announce Team or Backstage Interview Team, whatever you want to call it, definitely check that out. I think it was a really excellent interview. Um, I think it was my best interview that I've done personally. I was uh, really happy with it. And uh, if you guys are looking for some other podcasts that cover Impact... Uh, some really good ones, the Clock Cleaners, Six Sided Podcast, Pro Wrestling Personified, and uh, Broken But Glorious. So check those out. Ro, I, um, I don't know if you caught this, man. I just barely caught this before we uh, got on here. But the uh, I guess the ROH, ROH had a pay per view tonight, and Austin Aries. I think Austin Aries wrestled on the card against Kenny King. If I don't, if I'm not mistaken, I just I really don't follow, follow them a whole lot. But I don't know if you saw it on social media, but they aired a Austin Aries promo and he was holding up the impact title. So he had all his titles. Like he always does. He had like two or three of them on one arm, but he wasn't really lifting them up. He was, he was lifting up the impact one saying, you know, anyone from any promotion that wants to come take this from me, I'll come to your show or you come to my show. So did you catch that? I seen on Twitter. Uh, I just seen a picture of it because I remember this was a match that they had in the making. And, you know, the one thing I just thought was it made sense to put the title back on him because, you know, I had wondered, you know, when they had did the title change, you know, from Pentagon, I just I didn't understand why. But then, you know, they probably wanted him to face Kenny King as Impact Champion. So it all made sense. Yeah. And um, I think that promo, I think that finally opened the door to working with ROH. And I say open the door, but when the Hardys were still around, there was supposed to be the angle where they, they went to ROH and then the Bucks were supposed to come to Impact for a match, which would have been actually huge for Impact. Impact needed that very badly, but you know, due to some uh, poor management decisions and contract negotiations, they let the Hardys walk at the time. But yeah, so this is, this is interesting going forward to see what happens. With this being said, I said something on the live chat the other day what what did you think about the camera angles for the show because i felt i felt like they felt very ring of honor ish you know i it would be hard for me to compare just because the only um as far as shows of ring of honor that i've seen were during the Decim destination america days so i can't really compare I will say this show, like these tape, the, well, this this is the first set of tapings in Canada. It had a different feel to it, and that's what I liked. Yeah, because the the entrance ramp was on the other side, so that was really different. Because you know, wherever they film, which granted they haven't been out of Orlando very much in the last year or two, but it, but it always feels like the freaking impact zone in Orlando. You know, it always looks exactly like it. This time, entrance ramp was on the other side. And uh, different camera angles. I've been noticing these camera angles when they do like the House of Hardcore matches and stuff like that. And I remember thinking to myself, man, this feels like Ring of Honor. But I actually kind of liked it. I was like, I kind of wish Impact would do that. And that's what they're doing here. So my personal opinion is that they're trying to use similar, similar camera angles that ROH uses. So that if some of those talents do come over... It feels, it has the feel. So I guess what I'm getting at, if you watch Lucha Underground, they have their own set of camera angles. So it works for guys like Pentagon, Phantasma, all these dudes, Drago who come on Impact. But then they come on Impact and Impact is a complete different way of shooting. And you don't, you don't feel the Lucha Underground stars quite the same because you're not watching them from the same angles that 
you're used to watching him on LU, if that makes any sense at all. But I liked it. I, I thought it felt a little, little low budget, you know what I mean? But did you feel like it felt more realistic, though? Like it was a live sporting event, not not sports entertainment? It just, I mean, I don't know if I could use those type of words, but it just, it was a different feel. And I can't really uh, put a name to it, but it just, it totally seemed different from what we are accustomed to seeing in the impact zone. What do you got on the whole episode as a, as a whole? We're going to, um, you know, break it down obviously here in a little bit, but what do you think as a whole? You know, I thought it was nice. Um, the past couple episodes I was, was sour on. I mean, there is one thing we'll get to it. I'm sure you sure just like a lot of listeners will probably assume where I'm headed to. But outside of that, uh, I thought it was a nice episode. I enjoyed it. Yeah, dude, I was really engaged through the whole thing. I really was. Um, I think I was just so fascinated by the new presentation. that, And obviously the crowd was a complete different ball game. Um, totally engaged. And there was times where they got quiet, but they reacted when they were supposed to. And that's what I always say about Orlando. Like, fucking clap. Do something, you know? Um, you shouldn't just be sitting there resting on the rails, uh, not showing any kind of... Like, your mouth should at least open when you see something cool at, at a minimum, you know? So, dude, I was in love with it. Um, I just love love the presentation. Ratings were down quite a bit. 250 so it's one of the lowest rated rated shows of the year i feel like sometimes we make too many excuses about all oh, they went up against a draft and yeah i watched the draft over impact that night so it, it is a real thing to say hey sometimes there's competition but i think we blame it on that way too much man uh this was as close to a must-see episode of the year as as there's been because it was the first one in this was in windsor right yeah i believe so so it was the first one so this should have been the one everyone is really excited for. I don't think they pumped up the the card very well because they, they they at the last minute were like, oh, it's a uh, Pentagon and Sammy in a cage, but then they didn't even show the match. Um, I don't even know if they promoted any of the matches. They said they promoted the Desi Hit Squad debut. Why not just say Desi Hit Squad versus Z and E, like the former tag team champions? That, that would have gotten over better than just acting like they were in action and we're going to face some jobbers. Yeah, so maybe it was just a promotion of the show, but yeah, they were down, dude. I, I am now getting to the point where I like what they're doing, but something is not clicking. Something is not working. I know that it's, you know, a long process and everything, but we're talking six months into the year. Uh, half the year is down and ratings have not been very good lately and there's been no real excuse for it so i don't know what are your what are your thoughts overall on this uh rating situation you know for one i kind of look at it you know we see this sometimes like where the shows there's been shows that you know you and i and others have kind of been down on and the ratings have been high and the good shows the ratings are low the two things that stick out to me if i had to just guess I would say the lack of promotion, like I kind of feel these past couple of episodes, instead of advertising the, these matches for the for next week, they re resort to using social media. And I know you had talked about this in the past about their marketing. They're just relying so much on social media. You know, they need to do more. I would say that. And also, like, I don't think spoilers hurt. Because I think, too, sometimes for some people, if they read something and it's something that catches their eye, they're like, all right, I got to definitely catch that episode. But I think what hurts, and I'm going to tell you, one of the biggest ones was, if you remember a couple weeks ago where they had the number one contendership match between Eli and Moose, that was advertised as like a, a match that was happening at Impact. And we got a match that was at House of Hardcore. And I think that's one of the things too where they're advertising some of these matches and you're looking forward to seeing them in the impact zone yet they're they've been advertised uh not air advertised i'm sorry they had it was like kind of like a um a filler match that they might have taped you know months months ago and it just this it seems like kind of a lazy booking if i want to say i totally agree with that um i think there's a josh matthews overload you know if they're doing a stream on facebook or there's a show, something on the GWN or, or explosion around the ring, um, you know, Twitch, like it's always Josh. And a lot of people don't like Josh. Could you imagine if uh, WWE had Michael Cole do everything? <laughs> people would lose their minds, you know what I mean? 
and even like I, and I'm dating myself back a, a little bit here because I don't watch a whole lot of Ring of Honor now or I haven't watched it in a couple years but I remember Mandy Leone doing a lot of backstage stuff and sometimes it was just like promos for shirts or whatever but it was like they kind of use her sexuality a little bit and you've got like two really attractive girls in Alicia who's obviously new and uh, Mackenzie and it's like I guess what hurts Mackenzie is her, her wrestling background is not real strong, but I like you got to switch it up. And then think about the Twitch and the one night only is like, again, think of other wrestling companies. Like they switch up the broadcast team. Like they, they just, what impact is doing is they keep switching up the color commentator. But even though I do commend the presentation of the show, there's one thing that I really don't like. It's the green screen thing that him and Don do. I think it, uh, you're you're a little younger than me. Do you remember primetime wrestling a long time ago before Raw existed? <laughs> no, I don't, man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So it was a really good show. It was a two hour show. Um it was kind of like a explosion, so to speak, but but it was more popular than that, obviously. But in between matches, you know, they would have a little panel of guys speaking and then be like, All right, let's get back to ringside and Hillbilly Jim's in action or some bullshit like that. But even though the show was cool, it didn't feel like like you knew nothing was going to happen. And um, there's just something about that green screen shit where they're cutting in between, you know, supposedly like Impact is f airing. They're there in the arena and then they keep all of a sudden they're in the studio. And I just feel like that presentation is, is telling us, hey, nothing's going to happen today. I, I don't know. I don't I, I can't really like explain what I'm trying to say exactly, but there's just that to me doesn't feel like we're watching an important episode when we see them talking like that. Um, I don't I don't like that. Uh, but there's something that's not working. Another problem, I think, curious your opinion on this. I think the the wrestling podcasters are such big influencers. You know, I'm talking like, you know, Bully Ray. Um, this Sol Solomon monster motherfucker, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to say Cornette, but, um, I don't know. I don't listen to a whole lot of podcasts to be honest, but some of these big names, the influencers, they're still so down on the company. And the crazy thing is they're, they're doing things that are way better than the other companies are doing. Like take for instance, the Eddie and Sammy angle, like they're taking a break. Because if the, if these two were to have another match at Slam Reversary, and say Eddie wins, say Sammy wins, like where the hell do they go from there? You know, like now when you branch off Eddie, he continues his character build, and Sammy continues his character build, but not not shoving Eddie down our throat all the time. That's like way beyond something another company's doing. Like they'll just have have the same two motherfuckers fight for months on end, you know, but. What do you think about that, dude? I think um, the biggest reach right now is these podcasters. And they're still so down and they don't see the good. Like, it, it's frustrating. They don't see so many of the good things the company's doing. And if they're not passing on the word, you know, how are these people going to know, like, okay, it's time to give Impact a chance? Well, they have their audiences. And I think the thing I learned and what made me stop listening to Solo Monster was I realized that he was through and through WWE, WWF forever. Even uh, when he used to cover some WCW, like he would do some WCW flashbacks, and he was like, I was never a big fan. So right away, that lets you know WWE can be at its worst. I mean, they could just put on a show where they have the same guy wrestling the whole night, you know? They'll go and record a podcast talking about how terrible it is, but then tune in next Monday. Like, they have it, and they have their audience and, you know, the, the one thing, I don't think it's so much the podcasters. I really think, personally, wrestling isn't as big as how it used to be. You know, when you had in the late 90s or, you know, mid-90s where you had WWF, WCW, ECW, those, those were all different options where you had, they had their own fans, but st you also had some fans that was watching all three. And I think now, you know, everybody, especially with WWE trying to sign everybody and their mom, you know that they that's how they're getting everyone to you know getting all all the uh, fans to watch their product. You know, you look at a guy, for example, 
and I'm not too familiar with his work, like somebody like Kenny Omega, you know WWE wants to get him because they see the following that he has in, in their mindset. I, we can sign him, not use him, but just sign him and stuff. And those fans will want to watch, you know, hoping one day that we'll see him in WrestleMania against, you know, name said wrestler and five star, whatever, etc. So I don't think it's so much the podcasters. I just think it just has to do with, you know, people at the point where, you know, and, and even me, myself, I only watch Impact. You know, I tried to watch Lucha Underground. I've tried to watch Ring of Honor. I've tried to watch different promotions. Not so much that I dislike them, but I'm comfortable with Impact. So I think there there might be some fans too that don't necessarily hate Impact. But you know, if they are WWE faithful, Ring of Honor faithful, name the country, etc. Faithful, that's what they're just gonna stick with. Yeah, there's so many options with iPay per views and and everything. And you know, WWE is putting like content on almost every single day of the week. And now they're trying to do, I think, some kind of, I think they had a UK division, but they're trying to do a UK show, I think, maybe. Um, you know, they keep throwing these tournaments out there. They they are giving people so much content that I I just think there's a good portion of the wrestling audience that doesn't, does just doesn't want to watch any more wrestling. Um, I don't know, man, but I still think there's something that the Impact team is doing that's not working. But it is it is half a year in, but at the same time, it's half a year in. And uh, I feel like we should start seeing a little bit more growth. I mean, they're partnering with these indie companies and, you know, reaching out and touching those fans, which granted those are, you know, small fan bases. But, uh, you know, partnering with Lucha Underground and everything, man, there's just, there's just no change. And uh, as you said earlier, they rely so much on that social media, man. Just to give you guys an idea, so... Th- just look at any other, take Facebook, for instance. Um, I was watch. okay, take, for instance, LeVar Ball's Big Baller, whatever the fuck, J- JBA League. So they got like 90,000 likes on that page. I was watching one of the games today because it's absolutely terrible, but um, <laughs> <laughs> that's so bad, dude. But I was watching one of the games. There were 6,000 people watching. Um, with 90,000 likes impact has over a million and they stream something and there's 200 people watching, you know, there's so many people anti impact that follow their social medias that it actually hurts their numbers. Cause when they don't tune in, um, it makes the re I don't want to talk over people's heads with social media dude, but that's why I say that impact has to monitor these things because you have to have an engaged audience on social media like if you have too many trolls it it hurts your numbers like they're doing really good things they just they really got to stay the course yeah I, and i i think that i think that's just the main thing they can't overreact i honestly believe we're gonna get a rating spike you know if not next episode following episode i mean it just it, it happens sometimes because there was a month where it kept going up 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 and we're you know a lot of us were like cool because I mean, at the end of the day, I know we don't look too much into them, but obviously when we see that hike, you know, it's encouraging, you know, because you're like you're looking at it's like, wow, you know, the the show was good and the ratings reflected that. So, you know, sometimes for somebody who didn't watch your show and they're going based off the ratings, that's another thing, too, that they could probably look at it as like, oh, you know, it's the same old same. So there's really no answer. I mean, I wouldn't give the podcasters any credit you know, the ones that are negative to, towards impact because they can trash impact yet. You look at what they watch and, you know, they support that. You know, I, I always say it's a, uh, and you know, not that I'm applauding this, but it's that abusive mentality. You know, you re- you're being done wrong, but then there's that false sense of hope next week. He'll be better. Yeah. You know, they assure me it's going to be better. So, you know, and the last thing I'll add, like I read today, cause you know, you go on 401, like I do. I read that they said, uh, Brock Lesnar is not going to be, uh, at SummerSlam, so the title's not going to be defended. Now, of course, fans are upset, but guess what? They're still going to watch the pay-per-view, so, you know. <laughs> right, but they'll find any excuse not to watch Impact. You know, oh, I, yeah. I've used this comparison before. It's like the hot girlfriend. You're, you're dating this girl. She's kind of out of your league, and she treats you like dog shit. She doesn't clean the house. She doesn't cook for you. She doesn't uh, take you around her friends. She's got a bunch of guy friends that you don't know. But you just keep making excuses. And then you got this girl who's okay looking, but she treats you real good, treats you like a damn king. But because she snores at night, 
you're like, ah, now nah, this ain't this ain't gonna work, you know. And it's a uh, it's very similar. People use any excuse they can not to watch Impact. You know, Rich Rich Swan's one of the new excuses, like, well, he's a woman beater, so I can't support that, you know. But then you got Bray Wyatt openly cheating on his wife at one point, and uh, people are like, hey, go Bray Wyatt, good for you. You got JoJo, you know what I'm saying? So. Yeah, it, it, it at the end of the day, like I said, I just think, you know, you do have some fans who watch all wrestling and that I think that's what's good. But, you know, you got some that are faithful because there's some impact fans I see to uh, you know, on the social media channels, you know, they in in the impact comments, you know, they're praising impact while taking shots at WWE. It's like there's no need. Like WWE's doing their thing. If you don't like it, okay, we you know, we get it, but you know, why even uh, create that type of conversation, you know, conversation and stuff? They're doing their thing. And the last thing I'll add, I think, too, for some fans, you know, when you see AJ, like I know AJ is going to be on the cover of the new game. They look at that as like, well, we got the heart of TNA. And I think where Impact doesn't get credit enough is while we talk about in and that's why I was encouraging for them to re-sign Eli. We talk about them, you know, eventually they some of these people they shouldn't just let walk. They need to show that they value some of these guys. But Impact has been able to really shuffle the deck real well. One person leaves, someone come you know comes in, everything is fine. And I think, you know, fans from you know over there think like, oh, we got their guy, you know, it's it's over for them. You know, we got EC three. Uh there's no point in watching now. You know, and that's not the case. Impact you know, they're not crumbling. They've been able to, you know, replace the departed wrestlers and, you know, everything's been fine. So, I mean, you know what? I, I just think as long as they stay the course, they've been doing a fantastic job. I think things will pick up. Yeah. And the last thing I want to say, I know a lot of people are going to say, oh, well, you know, they do DVR numbers and that, that plays into it. And But if you make the show matter, then people will want to tune in when it's alive. That's that's the difference. Um you know, DVR is great and all, but we want people to want to watch it as it airs. Uh, let's get into questions, man. Questions, uh, listener questions. Um, let's let see what I got here. I think I'm going to go first on this one. Uh, all right, so Clay Rodriguez asks, what do you think Impact can do so the crowd in the Impact Zone is not dead and the crowd shows some reaction? So, my very first Impact show that I went to was top of 2016. It was the show that Drew Galloway won the world title. I remember sitting in the crowd. So, I got there a little bit late. Um, I got there while, I don't know if you remember this, Lashley was cutting a promo in the ring. And he was going to take out Josh Matthews and the Pope came in to save him. Yeah, I remember. Okay, so I walked in during that. It was very loud in there. I mean, like, deafening loud during that. And I remember just thinking, I was there for a couple episodes. I remember thinking, this crowd this crowd is pretty hot. You know, like, I thought it was uh, very loud in there. One thing that they had back then, I don't know if you remember, they had it for maybe the first two sets of tapings. They had, like, the paddles that said pop on them. Okay, yeah, and I don't remember that. Yeah, they're paddles like, you know, kind of like you play um, ping pong with. Mm -hmm. um, I still have it in the trunk of my car, actually. Um, but yeah, it just says pop on it. And people could, you know, we all got one and we would slap our hands against it. You know, and that was a lot of the reason it was so loud in there because they had something to make noise with. Another thing is, I don't think, obviously, Jeremy Borash is gone. So someone who's in the impact zone maybe listening can uh help me out with this but i know when i was there all the times i was there between matches jeremy borash would do whatever he could to get the crowd going he would say hey we're we're coming on in three two one or he would uh he did this thing one time man he got the crowd to boo even though it was completely unrelated to what was going on and as everyone was booing one of the heel knockouts came out or something I don't, I don't remember who it was, but someone came out that was a heel. might have been Maria Canellis, and uh, everyone was already booing. So it, it kind of, like, added something extra when she came out. So sometimes it's, man, it's just interacting with the people a little bit, waking them up. And I really think some something you make noise with. I'll say Ring of Honor has the thing that they slap. The guys in the front row, it's, like, attached to the barrier. You know, 
maybe just giving them something that makes freaking noise shakers something but uh but i don't know it's i i really take it back to complacency you know the show's been there for so long that's really what i take it back to but uh you got any thoughts on this yeah, you know, it's weird because the one thing that I noticed and, you know, I had to kind of refresh my memory some, it's crazy to think when you when you see, you know, when they show the GWM flashbacks and you see the crowd and to think that that was in the same arena that it's in right now. Um, I think some of it has to do with, is just a combination of things. Sometimes fatigue, you know, I know sometimes the the long set of taping, some of the crowd, you know, get tired or whatever. Some of it being spoiled, you know, it's been there for so long. And I think a lot of times, too, you probably get a lot of casuals. So maybe you get people who aren't even necessarily wrestling fans. So, you know, they don't follow the product or, you know, they don't follow wrestling in general. So they really don't know. They're just kind of just there spectating. So it, it's really hard to really kind of figure out. And I think that's the one thing that we see when whether, you know, they do in Canada or some of the live shows, you see the different crowds. It seems like it's more fans as opposed to, you know, people going to the park and like, hey, let's check this out. You know, we've rode every ride in the park. Let's go see this wrestling, you know. So, yeah, that's but, just my, that's my thing. But, man, for, so for, for someone that's been in the impact zone, like the, the impact zone is not really that close to the it's actually by the exit of the park. And. I don't know if I pay to go into the park, I'm not going to go watch wrestling for three hours. You know, it's that's why, you know, I, I feel like I say this almost every episode that I feel like there's not as many tourists in there as people think there are some in there, but it's not a, you, you would just have to see where the impact zone is to really understand this being said, the impact zone is like a hike from where you park. I mean, you get tired by the time you even freaking get there. Um, it's not something where you can just kind of pull up like the when I went to Lucha versus Lucha uh, Lucha Underground versus Impact, you know, I parked pretty damn close and walked in and it's a wrap, you know. But yeah, it, it, it's kind of the venue a little bit, man. The the, uh, the Impact Zone. All right, what you got for a question? Yeah, this one's from uh, Stephen Hudson. He asks, "Would you like to see a mass versus mass match at some point with uh, Pentagon versus Phantasma?" You know, with when you have mass versus mass matches, I think you have to be careful because usually the loser we've seen in uh, uh, past history in wrestling, usually when someone loses their mass, they kind of lose their character a bit. The only one that comes to mind that was able to really bounce back and then he eventually put the mask back on was Rey Mysterio. But like the one guy that really sticks out to me was a uh, psychosis. I forgot what match he took part in, but when he lost his mask, he was just, he just seemed like just a regular guy. I know he had wrestled in other federations where he was successful, but even when he resurfaced back in WWE, he just seemed like whatever compared to when, you know, he was masked. So, I mean, you know what, if they build a, a good, a great story to it, I don't have a problem with it, but it's just, you know, the loser with it, you know, what happens next? You know, is that, are the, you know, you still going to be able to, you know, be able to utilize that character's his best abilities or is that the end? So, I mean, that's really all I got on it. What do you have, BQ? I'm not a fan of mask versus mask. Um, I don't mind the mask versus hair. I'm more, I'm actually really intrigued with that, but I'm mainly intrigued because I think Sammy Callahan's going to lose. I don't think anyone's ever knock i don't think any heels ever <laughs> not gotten their head shaven um and i think i think they are going to shave sammy's head so that he can take the next uh next step in his heel character um you know i can think of some people who like kurt angle someone like you know he was kind of balding so they shaved his head you know and they they found an excuse to do it so I think that it's probably in the match is designed as an excuse to to shave his head so he can um, grow his character a little bit. But as far as like mask versus mask, I'm not big on that. Um, I'm big on the respect that that uh and, and the lineage that those masks hold. And I don't I don't think the guy should be unmasked because Pentagon most look most likely looks like a normal everyday dude under that mask. That would hurt his character so much if he got unmasked. You know, yeah, I so, agree. Yeah, there's some guys who could get away. I mean, I guess per probably get away with it, but I'm not, I'm not a big fan of it personally. 
Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I think for, when you look at most of these mass wrestlers, a lot of them obviously lucha guys or cruiserweights. So when you take that away, you're kind of taking away the whole mystique. But, I mean, we've seen some. I mean, even when you think about a guy like Kane, uh, he was able later on to be somewhat successful without it. But a lot of times, you know, when you take that mask away, that really kind of kills the wrestler, so to speak. So, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, like I said, it, it just would depend what they were trying to do, what would be the story, and then what's the follow-up with it. You know, if you have a guy lose his mask and then, you know, we don't ever hear from him again, and then he resurfaces with the mask again, you know, what was the point? So Yeah, and it doesn't work. I mean, I, I even think when Abyss puts his mask on, I'm just like, dude, that's just Joseph Park under a fucking mask. So, <laughs> um, and then same with Kane later in his career, too. Like, that mask meant absolutely nothing. So, um, what you got for a trivia question? Uh, I, I already know the answer from the last week's because I saw it in the uh, comments, but um, what you got trivia-wise... Okay, well, for the answer for Adam's uh, trivia was uh, Joey Ryan, and I didn't. I don't know who was the first person to get it right, but I think the thing that gave it away is when they talked about that move that he uses, that where he grabbed something with the groin or something like that. I don't know, but um, so congratulations to everyone who got that right. I think majority of the people did, anyways. So this week, my the trivia question that I have is: I'm a multi knockouts champion former multi-time knockouts champion. I had the luxury of facing a former, well, not former, but a Hall of Famer in the grandest stage in Impact Wrestling. And finally, the, the last clue that I'm going to give is I once defeated a person using her own move. Who am I? All right, cool. I like that. All right, so let us get into the show now. Kind of a long opening, but uh, let's let's get on to Impact. So very first thing that they did, um, we got Rich Swan versus Trevor Lee. Oh, and I'm sorry. Shit, let me start that over. All right, so kind of a long opening, but let's get into Impact now. So Impact kicked off this week with a talking segment, which they haven't been doing in a while. And of all people, it was Madison Rain. They're kind of fast-tracking her to the knockouts title picture. As I said on my live chat the other day, the way I would have done it is actually have Madison Rain, you know, because she was supposed to be in the booth that match um, with Tessa Blanchard. I wish they would have had her in the booth for at least two or three episodes and build a little tension between her and Tessa um, so that that match meant a little bit more when it happened and then kind of build Madison there. But they're kind of fast tracking her and I understand why they don't really have anyone to fit in that role. Even though I don't really see why Ali could, and now that Ali's back, I figured Ali was written off TV for a while. But um, yeah, Madison has a talking segment of all people, but it didn't bother me because the crowd was actually reacting. Her mic was not of the highest quality, but the crowd was reacting to what she was doing, so it made me actually care a little bit more. And then Tessa Blanchard came out. And they had their little thing. And then uh, by the end of that, we get Tessa versus Madison Rain for the main event. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But I thought I think every time Tessa comes out, her promos are really good. Kind of pokes fun at the mom thing. Um, Josh Matthews all of a sudden is not married to Madison Rain. And <laughs> he is the most inconsistent commentator I've, I, I can think of in wrestling in a really long time. I mean, a guy who just... I, I, man, I go back to my childhood and think of uh, Roddy Piper. He's the do color commentary. He was real inconsistent too. Uh, Macho Man, he did color commentary. He's really inconsistent too. But those were guys that were wrestlers, kind of came into a role like Josh. Dude, he talks one, oh, I, I did this and this with Matt Seidel. Then the next one, he's questioning Matt Seidel's actions. And then he, one week, is talking about his wife, Madison Rain. Now, all of a sudden, he's not married to her. And I noticed that during the first match where Tessa hit that um, kind of a flat liner when she has them, has them tied up in the turnbuckles, and he was like, ball game, like he was calling like the match was over. And then when it's like, oh, it's an upset, like that's when it started like, I'm like, is he pretending he's not married to her? And now as every episode goes on, you can see that that is the case. But what do you got on the opening segment with Madison Rain talking and uh, Tessa Blanchard coming down. 
As far as the segment, I have no problem with it. Like I said, I'll go on record. I have nothing, no problem with Madison Rain, and I understand what they're doing, but I just feel like they didn't have to go the route that they've been going. I think she's accomplished enough, and anybody who's followed the product or, you know, even, even – I, well, I get why they're doing it, but I just didn't think it, it warranted the route that they're going. But I thought this promo was good because, I mean, I guess they're going with the whole redemption story. You know, she stated that she didn't anticipate, you know, being active in the ring again. But, you know, the thought of being a six-time knockout is something – a knockout champion, I should say, is something that she was enamored by. And, you know, having Tessa – I mean, Tessa, there's not any – else I could say about her I mean it's just everything is just magnificent with her she knows how to work the camera she knows how to talk on the mic even her ring work and you know the only thing I could think is and you know we'll get into it more like I don't know her contract status but you know maybe that's the reason why you know Tessa kind of seems like you know she's in the background for all of this because you think about when she debuted initially at Redemption, you know, she was made to be a big deal. And then it was like, you know, you have her lose to Madison Rain, and then that just kind of just, you know, took all the air out of the balloon, so to speak. So, but as far as the segment, that's fine. And I think as far as what we're seeing with Josh, I think the reason why he's trying to downplay all that is it, he doesn't want it to come across as nepotism. I mean, we all know, and you think most recently in basketball with uh, the Clippers, for example, you know, the, the biggest story was with the coach and his son, you know, his son getting to play more than everyone else. And it was never, oh, it's not because it's my son. It's just because he's a good player. We all knew what was the reason why. So I think that's kind of the reason why that you're, you're seeing Josh kind of downplay it because it, he doesn't want it to come across or the company doesn't want it to come across as she's getting this push because she's married to Josh. Not saying Josh has that much pull in the company, but you know what I mean? Yeah, I agree with you there. I know Tessa... Tessa's contract status because we did a uh, teleconference about three four weeks ago this was the one teleconference that there were some audio issues on it when it started and it never made it to YouTube and Facebook and all that so the only people that heard it was us on the call and it mm -hmm. sucks because that was a good one <laughs> but Tessa had said she's on a uh, per appearance deal at the moment but she said they are negotiating a contract um, someone when uh, someone had asked is it a long-term contract and she said, just don't believe what you read on the Internet. So I, I think she was kind of insinuating um, all the people who are saying, oh, she's just probably there to um, kill time until the May Young thing happens or whatever. You know, that's what I think she was alluding to because she, uh, you know, several times talked about this year. I'm going to have good matches with the knockouts and everything. So uh, she is her appearance at the moment. So I think you're on to something there. I think that's uh what it is because she's got a 500 record right now so uh yeah i agree they just could have just if if madison rain's gonna keep saying oh i was just here to call the action then actually like have some matches where she called the action i mean she just showed up one episode and all of a sudden had a feud so um but enough enough of madison first match of the evening was rich swan versus trevor lee what do you got on rich's rich swan's very first match they really made him out to be a big deal, um, just the whole presentation. You know, I did wonder, you know, some of his mannerisms is similar to Sugar Dunkerton. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He yeah. had wrestled on Explosion a couple times. But what they did, man, this – the way to debut – debut someone they did him wonders in this and they gave him a great guy to work with in trevor lee you know i did find it weird that trevor lee came out by himself i mean i don't think there's any you know indication of the breakup of cult of lee because they even had mentioned it but yeah this was a solid debut and i thought uh rich swan i'm not too familiar with his work i've seen a handful of matches when he was a cruiserweight champion but this was some nice stuff and uh, i think he's a great addition to the x division I think he is too. He gives a little star power. He was on the teleconference uh, this past one. I need to upload it still, but he was really enjoyable to talk to. And um, it's it's it sucks because he was talking about depression and he, he was in a state of depression after everything that happened and all the fans were attacking him online. And it's, it's really unfair because none of us know the story. Um, I know I've, I've been in unhealthy relationships in the past and i've been uh accused of very similar actions when that's not what happened at all but sometimes you just know two people have a um 
have a dispute and then the story just gets kind of twisted into something that is really not. But I, I enjoy the match quite a bit. I got to give Rich Swan props in the very end of this match. You've heard me talk about this before. So when he wants to hit his, you know, when he's going to hit his finisher, he positions Trevor Lee in the correct position in the turn, you know, in the corner instead of what 99% of other wrestlers do. And that's they start scooching on the ground and getting in position and it never looks good. It never looks realistic. <laughs> and it's crazy as a fan watching that because I'm like, how do these agents not see that? Like it looks terrible, but every company does it. So I was, I was really happy to see that. And growing up in the eighties, that very rarely happened. Like they always like body slam the guy in position. It wasn't like a now where they like just so happen to fall in position. Like there's always some kind of setup move to put them where they needed them to be. So I really like that. I thought I thought that was cool. But I thought it was a pretty um excellent match. Good debut. I've said this before too. X Division, the heel always loses unless it's a multi man match and the titles on the line. Um but or I should just say the titles on the line in general is the only time the heels ever seem to win in an X Division match. Because usually they're the opener. You know, you, you get the people pumped, cheering for the good guy. So uh, I think we all knew Rich was going to win. And he had, he had a good opponent. So they really tore it down. He said on the teleconference that his match versus Phoenix last... Um, that his match versus Phoenix next week is a classic. He said that when they were done, all the boys in the locker room were waiting for them backstage... Um, you know, one of those, one of those reactions. Uh, so keep an eye out for that one next week. It's supposed to be an absolute classic. All right. So after this, we get PCW ultra, I believe that's in California actually. Um, and they promoted this steel cage match of Sammy Callahan versus Pentagon. But all it was, was them attacking. One thing I noticed here is that the camera angles were the exact same as what we're seeing on Impact right now. So there's almost more cohesiveness when they do the indie stuff now. So I think that's done by design. So um, props off, to, props to them for that. Uh, but basically it was a beat down and he removed Pentagon's mask. So if you want to build Sammy Callahan as a really real credible heel and the best heel, you got to have him do heel work to everybody. Um, not not just the Eddie Edwards feud. Like, he has to be across the board an asshole. So, I think they're doing an excellent job with that. Uh, thoughts on this one? I liked it because I think when you're talking about having, and I know this is just to set up the mask versus hair match. You know, we've seen in, in wrestling that a lot of these times, mask versus hair, usually the person's losing their hair. Or if it's mask versus title, usually the person's losing their mask. So I thought, because at first I thought, I was like, we're not going to see him remove it. So to, ha to see him remove it, it kind of gives you the idea that he's more than capable of not only winning, you know, the match when they potentially face one another, but you know, he can remove Pentagon's mask. I will say this, and I know you had uh, mentioned this earlier. It leads me to believe that the Callahan and Eddie Edwards feud, it makes me feel like it's done because we're seeing Sammy move on. Like, do, don't you think if they were to go back, like after his feud with Pentagon, if they were to go back and revisit that, do you think it would still make any sense? Because we're seeing Eddie Edwards kind of going in between teetering kind of you know, he's not face. I, I wouldn't say he's full blown heel, but he's just going into crazy mode. So it would just do you don't you think it'd be weird if after Callahan's done with Pentagon, he goes back to feuding with Eddie Edwards? No, I actually don't like I actually think what they're doing is genius because they've got Sammy where he's just like he's just moving on. He's like, I'm done with this fool. But Eddie is still like obsessed with him. But now he has another roadblock. And um, that's why I was saying earlier, like if you would if. There's only so far a feud can go where the same two people wrestle each other week in and week out. It doesn't matter how good the feud is. At some point, it's going to be like, okay, this is enough. And they want to keep this one hot. So I think what they're trying to do is make this that feud that um, I, wish I, could, I wish I had a good comparison. Because there's only a handful in wrestling history that you know uh, can revisit a feud and it kind of picks up where it left off. But I think that is the goal that they can always fall back on Eddie and Sammy. Like it's a story that just never really ends because, because uh, neither of them are satisfied because you can't keep, 
you can't keep building Eddie's character and keep just having him fuck with Sammy. Like it's just like I said, you build Sammy as a heel by being having be an asshole all the way around. Now you got Eddie acting crazy to multiple people. So um, no, I actually I actually like that they're doing it. Yeah, interesting. I was just wondering because you know even watching it, I was just, I had thought I said. Well, after all this, when this is done, I mean, would it make sense? Because one would assume that the feud that we're getting with Eddie and we'll get into it is something with Dreamer. So I don't know. We just have to see how it plays out. But Callahan, man, if he, if I had to give an MVP, you know, for the first half of the year for Impact, Callahan, man. And this should be the feud of the year. So at the end of the year, you know, they're going to do all this voting, PWI in them, in them. You know what I mean? They're going to have AJ versus Nakamura. Uh, Champ, what the hell these dudes name Gargano and Champa, <laughs> you, you know, um, and you know, you know Eddie and Sammy aren't going to get the the props they deserve, even though the AJ and one, from what I understand, hasn't been very compelling. And then uh, the other one in NXT, they're just from what I know about it, they're just fucking a tag team that broken up that broke up, um. But they're just doing wrestling matches. You know, they're just going back and forth. Right? Like, there's no, like, bigger story like what Sammy and Eddie are doing. So, you know, creatively, it's it's just two motherfuckers wrestling. This this is the feud of the year. We get our favorite, the uh, GWN flashback. And it's a 2005 King of the Mountain match, which I like. They didn't do this towards the end. But when they have the little timers, the little countdown and everything. You know, when they started doing King of the Mountain matches the last year or whatever uh, that they were around, they were just like whatever matches. So it actually made me think, like, Mac, I kind of want to see these King of the Mountain matches come back because, you know, previously I didn't really want to. But we had Abyss out there, Monty Brown, Raven, Sean Waltman, and of course AJ. Um, they cannot help themselves. We're going to see AJ, Angle, or freaking Joe. We, we already know that's going to happen. And this is where Raven won the NWA title. So we are both against this whole GWN flashback thing. This one I actually kind of liked. What about you? I did. You know, and it it reminded me what initially brought me into where it made me start watching TNA. Because the, the one thing that I used to love about TNA, and even you think about Impact now, they've always been willing to give wrestlers who maybe elsewhere didn't get the opportunities due to politics they've given them a chance and we've seen here because you think about a guy like raven i don't know if you were big on raven but it, most of his success came from ecw and i remember back in the days you know talking about ecw to a lot of my friends they used to look at ecw as you know trash wrestling and all oh, the best wrestlers you know that you know we got all the best wrestlers in WWF who used to be in ECW. I mean, sounds like a familiar argument that you would hear nowadays. So, so uh, you know, and for him to win this match and win the title, it you know it was a big it was a big deal. You know, give credit to TNA. They made Raven more than just a hardcore guy. You know, he was made a uh, made a big deal. And um, yeah, I would love to see the King of the Mountain match. I think every now and then, I know sometimes we hate the idea of having multi-man matches for the title, but I think in some ways it establishes contenders. You know, instead of seeing, like say for a prime example, we, you know, we look at Austin Aries, maybe he faces Eli, then he faces Moose, then he faces someone, and then it's just he's facing the same people again. You know, sometimes you have the multi-man match, it gives an opportunity to integrate certain people. Maybe we not we might not necessarily see all the time in the main event picture. So it's something that maybe, I don't know, dare I say bound for glory, something they try to revisit. But I'm of the mindset that a lot of the old concepts of the of the old era of TNA, I think they're doing away with it. And we've seen with the Feast or Fired. I think it's safe to say that's the last time we'll see Feast or Fired. I hope so, because I'm not a big fan of that. But yeah, this was okay. Um, I just wish, uh, like I said, man, I just want one of these flashbacks to happen and it's not... You know, some of the guys I just mentioned, you know, I, I just really want to see some of the guys who we really know from TNA. I mean, that would just make so much more sense. Um, Katarina is backstage with Grado. Get, Grado called her um, Katriana, I believe, mm -hmm. at some point. Um, can't believe they didn't reshoot that. She informs them that she has a match next week. So we're going to get her in the ring. And when she was on the teleconference, we asked her about the whole winter thing. And she she had said, I'm just a new character this time around. 
that's that's just what it is. But then in this, she acknowledged being winter and acknowledged being a two-time knockouts champion. So we'll see who she faces next week. Uh, Speaking of knockouts, though, we talked about this um, extensively on my live show the other night. Did you see, did you catch that red silhouette dancing? Yes, and I was trying to figure out all night who exactly was that. And I seen on Twitter you had had an idea of someone, but I don't think it was. I don't think it's her. I think it's one of the ones I remember seeing a couple weeks ago. Some uh, some uh, female competitor. I think for Rise, uh, they had announced that she was working the tapings. I was I was assuming it was her. Yeah, it's a. You're you're referring to Shotzi Blackheart, but Blackheart is kind of like a badass. Um, she's Asian. She has green hair, super sexy. Like she's insanely hot. Um, and I've seen her in person. She is amazing, but her character, that doesn't fit her character. And we're having a Twitter conversation about it. A lot of people think it's Scarlet Bordeaux. I put in the conversation cause someone tagged Shotzi and they're like, I think it's Shotzi Blackheart. And I said, that doesn't fit her gimmick. And she liked my my response but she didn't like anybody else's in the conversation so i kind of took that as it's not her (laughs) um but scarlet bordeaux like she's like real real sexy like it kind of fits what she does you know maybe it's some people think maybe it's um danielle monet uh summer ray um so we'll see Uh, some people think it's just a big brother pop-up or something for Pop TV, but I think it would have said Pop TV. But yeah, that's good. I We're think. getting Katarina in the ring next week. Yeah, that's going to be interesting. And you know, the thing that I like what she was able to do was she's like, I'm a two, a former two time knockouts champion and, uh, you know, winter. And then he had looked at, uh, Greater, I looked at her. He's like, oh, you know, something with the season. Like, I thought that was a nice way to kind of like cover it up. Yeah, he was completely shocked. Like, um, you were? <laughs> so. Uh, Desi Hit Squad had their official debut, so they they've been wrestling on one night only in Twitch shows for a little while now, and it was Rohit Raju and Gursinder Singh with Gama Singh, of course, and they took on uh, DJ Z and Andrew Everett. Um, so the Desi Hit Squad was initially announced as four people. I think they're gonna bring those people along in due time, but these are the two the two main guys. We've talked extensively about. Rohit Raju's booking and you know they they could have at least built him up somewhat before giving him a partner you know he hasn't he hasn't recorded a single win outside of explosion and now he's a tag team and they win uh Gama Singh he he cut a promo on on the one night only show that he 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 got a lot of heat during it um this time around he cut a promo and it was kind of like whatever no one really booed him or or responded so they didn't get the heat that I was hoping they would get, especially versus uh, Z and E, who just continues to do like amazing offense never seen before. What do you got on the Desi Hit Squad's debut? Did you think, uh, you know, did you agree with these guys being the opponents, or, or, or should they have went up against some jobbers? Yeah, they should have went against some enhancement talent because on one end you're looking at it. DJ Z and Andrew Everett just recently lost tag team titles. So, I mean, I get, you know, they wanted to the Desi Hit Squad to get a win against someone credible, but not against them. You know, and it just makes you wonder that, you know, we had always talked about makeshift tag team. I think Z and Everett are, is a, are could be, you know, a potential staple in the tag team division. Their chemistry, man, is just, it's incredible. And as far as the Desi Hit Squad, I really thought that what they should have done with Rohit Raju, they should have had him cut some type of promo saying, you know, when you know after any of the matches that he lost, like, hey, you know, things are going to change. Run some kind of promo where it's showing that, hey, once the Hit Squad comes, you know, my fortunes are going to change. Because essentially you're talking about now, you know, if I'm a, a casual fan watching – Oh, this is this guy. Oh, this is where he's a part of. Man, I've never seen him win. You know, so you're really kind of interested in the other guy. The one point I'm going to make, and tell me if you catch this, I've noticed why it seems like in wrestling, just all across the board, it seems like everyone of Middle Eastern descent uses the sky high. Everyone Samoan uses a Samoan drop. What, what, what's up with that? Well, probably Samoan drop because it's called Samoan, but I don't know what's up with the sky high. 
I, I'm not I'm not really sure on that one. I know that and is their finisher. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it came across a little clunky, but that's their tag team finisher, and um, it didn't it didn't seal the victory. They actually uh, broke up the pin. But I agree with you, man. Like the thing is, Rohit Raju is actually excellent on the microphone, and they've given him no real mic time. But they could have built it up. And my conversations with him, like offline about it, I will just say he j- was just as confused as we were. <laughs> That's all I'm gonna <laughs> say about it. Um, he had no clue when they were gonna debut as a tag team, um, and I-, I could sense a little bit of frustration in his voice. So I think he feels very similar uh, about the whole thing. But I'm finally, I'm I'm glad they're finally here. Uh, and I-, I like Gersinder saying, I-, I-, I wish he could have showed a little bit more, but. Um, but I, w- I was just glad to see them on TV finally. It, it was it was a fine match, you know, a cheating victory. It wasn't like they beat them clean. But I agree, they, these guys just dropped the titles. And now they lose again. Yeah, it didn't make any sense. But you know what, now we can honestly say, you know, we had been talking about this for the past month. Now we can we actually have a tag division. So now that LAX is champions again, there's at least a couple more teams for them to work with before you know we run into what we always run into with them. We got a uh, video package on Moose. I, honest to God, didn't really pay attention to this. Do you think that this main event for Slammiversary is, I don't know, for lack of a better term, kind of a weak main event? No, because I think with Moose doing the whole Mr. Impact and, you know, even watching this, I'm still baffled that this is his first Impact World title opportunity. You think about it, you know, and and I can't recall. I don't think we've had too many multi-man matches for the Impact World Championship. I think, if anything, they've just been limited to a triple threat. But the fact that this is his first title shot, it, it kind of makes it a big deal for me. And... You know, I, I, I really think this is it's really going to be telling, you know, this is his chance to shine. I think if he can really, you know, show that he can hang, you know, I, I, I'm of the mindset that he's walking out with the championship. I know a lot of people, you know, see otherwise, but to me, it just would make more sense. You know, you're doing all of this and he's really, if you think about it, the top face in the main event scene. That's the one thing that's been hurting is there's not a whole lot of main event baby faces i'm not really excited about the match but one thing i've noticed about moose on the pay-per-views is that he always over delivers at the pay-per-view you know he'll have his own special entrance and then he will do something during the match that stands out he'll do something different so i think the match is going to over deliver and that's a criticism i've really had on impact man just under promise and over deliver they they hype stuff up sometimes, man. Like, so they announced the four-way match, which I actually am really excited about. But Rich Swan, Phoenix, um, is it Phantasma? No, no, Fe- Ishimori wait. and Johnny Impact. And, yeah, correct. I'm so sorry. I'm ex- I'm really excited about that. But they announced it on Twitter in capital letters with periods saying, "Look at this match." Like, stop. I, I really want them to stop doing that. Just, just. Let the people create the buzz. Don't tell us, oh, this is going to be the best. Just announce the matches. Let the people get excited. Um, but I do think this is going to be the mat- one of the matches that really over-delivers. What do you got on that match? Uh, is that something you're interested in, that four-way? See, it's a little random, but I think it has like show stealer potential all over it. It does, but it is not a little. It is random. I think Johnny Impact, I, I don't know where you would have thrusted him. I would have preferred to have him have some type of one-on-one match and then, you know, have him maybe cut something where he's talking about, hey, I have my eyes set on the winner of the main event. Um, it just seemed kind of weird. You, we get Rich Tron debuting on this episode, and then he's advertised for the pay-per-view. So, I mean, if I'm somebody who's going to be off the pay-per-view, I mean, I could see how that would bother me a little bit. And then, you know, having Ishimori, it, uh, I mean, I don't know. I think this is one of these matches that they could have probably advertised a couple weeks before the actual event. I know, I guess, you know, seeing that this is, you know, the end of June, I guess we're it's safe to say three weeks away. But, yeah, it just came, came across as random. Um, but, yeah, I do think it's going to deliver. And this is a match that any of these four guys could win. 
So uh, when it's not predictable, that's what I'm, I'm excited about it. So they ha- Eddie Edwards appears at House of Hardcore. So this is, they're taping in Windsor. We got a hot crowd. We got a new environment. We got a new presentation. And twice they leave the impact zone. And uh, the second one was for Eddie Edwards busting up um, Tommy Dreamer at House of Hardcore. So it it was cool. Uh, I think it's a good good uh, feud for for Eddie right now. That I think it makes sense, you know. Um, so Moose got involved in it. So I feel like is Eddie going to? I, I mean, I hope not because that's overbooking like a mother. But I'm like, is, mm, is Eddie going to get involved in Moose's title match? Because you know you, that. That would be interesting. Yeah, like, I, I don't know. Sometimes you got to read between the lines. Kind of like when uh, Austin Aries had that random heel turn and then was doing the town address, and you could tell something was going on with Moose, the way Moose left. Yeah, I think we talked about it after that. We're like, he's going to challenge for the world title next. Um, I, I feel like Moose is going to play some kind of role in all this. Maybe Eddie turns on Moose, you know? Uh, I could see where maybe Moose wins the title and then Eddie takes it off him, but I, I personally don't think Austin's going to lose, but interesting. They're kind of, they're kind of, uh, intertwining the storylines a little bit in the feud. So that, that just makes things more interesting. Speaking of interesting LAX, at the clubhouse, they're, uh, celebrating and I would have liked for it to go a little bit longer with King, like being, you know, uh, not being accused of what he's being accused of, but I'm really engaged with this. I wonder what Diamante's role is. I'm hoping she was at the freaking tapings because we've been waiting for her forever. And now first one's in Canada and she's not there. So I really hope she was at these tapings. <laughs> I swear <laughs> to God. Um, but what I took away from this man, King is a phenomenal actor. I mean, he's, he's excellent. There's no, all these guys are actually LAX. I, th- I think they're all really good. Uh, some of the camera angles, a little bit cheesy uh, when they do the LAX stuff, but I think it's, I think it's excellent. Uh, what do you think about this? Yes, man, this whole angle King has just been money and it's just a damn shame. You think about where they had him in DCC and they just use him like nothing. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, down the road, when it, once this culminates, we see him back in the ring. I feel like I've never really got an opportunity to see what he can bring to the table. But the thing that I love about this is you think about last week where he was kind of like, hey, man, no, no, I'm good. And then this week we've seen him kind of like, man, you know, he kind of got into Conan's face. And I thought that was that was nice, you know, because I didn't want to just see him keep backing down to essentially this older guy. So, and, you know, he's all talking about New York and the boroughs. Um, but... <laughs> All of this, man, I think King has been golden. I'm glad to see him back in Impact. Hell yeah, man. It's almost like we fantasy booked it, dude. I mean, <laughs> how how long were we talking about why is he not involved with LAX in some capacity? So um, I, I heard that uh, I didn't announce this on my channel because I don't want people to lose their shit. But that LAX was very i actually texted you about it you were the one person i talked to lax was uh they were having contract negotiations and lax was close to not resigning um but i believe getting kingston involved in their angle was was one of their uh negotiating points so i don't know how true that is but that was just uh, what i was told so uh i know how much you love random x division title matches we get Matt Seidel versus Desmond Xavier. Uh, I expect a, a little bit more out of the match, but I, th- I thought it was good. Um, I was tr- well, As I was watching, so at the very end, so Desmond does that dive and he overshoots Matt Seidel. I don't know if that was done by design or if he overshot him and, you know, because he acted like he injured himself or if he just had the wherewithal to, to say, okay, I missed him. Let me... Uh, let me, let me pretend I, I'm injured. Let me pretend I hurt myself cause I overshot him. So I don't know exactly what it was, but I thought the ending sequence was, was pretty good. This was the most heelish that Matt Seidel has looked since actually turning heel. Like, uh, just what he was doing in the ring. He, he's starting to get more comfortable in that role. 
So that's what I, I really took away from it that I liked. And then uh, Matt Seidel obviously got the win. And then after the match, uh, Brian Cage comes down. But then Kongo Kong comes down and takes out Brian Cage. And that splash that Kong did looked like it really hurt. And this is the first time we've seen Brian Cage on his ass. And it goes back to what I said about intertwining storylines. Like Brian Cage comes out, you know he's got his his eyes on the X Division title, but Kong also has a problem with Cage. Kong has nothing to do with the X Division, but he's about to, you know, he wants to go after Cage. So he comes out, set up a match for next week. And uh, again, this is some of the things that I think that Impact is doing that other people aren't. They're just getting other wrestlers um, involved in the storyline so that they can branch out a little bit. So uh, thoughts on the X Division title match? You know, I, I don't, I didn't recall it was it being a title match. I thought it was a non-title match, but no, it was fine. Um, I'm wondering what's the direction with Desmond Xavier. I really thought he was going to be next in line to potentially challenge for the X Division Championship, but we see, you know, it seems like the story with him is in big matches with a lot on the line. He f- falls a co- ah, excuse me, fails the come up short. So. And, you know, the post-match, I think what I'm looking forward to, because I think in Impact now, this is Brian Cage's really first major feud, you could say. Because since he's been here, you know, been with Impact, you know, we've seen him go through some of the lower card wrestlers. And then, obviously, we've seen him do the world tour. And then he had the match, obviously, with Matt Seidel, where they're booking it. Like, now he's no longer undefeated, even though he lost by countout. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, so to see him versus... Congo Kong, I think that's going to do a big, big, uh, do wonders for Brian Cage. So, yeah, and then to have Kong hit that move, I mean, that was the first time we've seen Brian Cage in Impact look vulnerable, you could say. Don't forget, he also beat Bobby Lashley twice. So, oh, I think Bob, what I'm. He doesn't count. No, <laughs> <laughs> I think what I'm excited about with this match is Brian Cage has done some really good work so far, and the Impact Zone's been giving him nothing. Um, he's dove over the top rope. He's done uh, her Karanas. Um, he's done some high flying stuff, and the uh, the Orlando crowd was just staring at him. So I think he's going to get what he deserves this time around if he uh, you know puts on that kind of performance. But um, I like Congo Kong a lot, so I'm looking forward to this match next week. I hope it's better than Kong versus Moose because that um that one almost put me to sleep uh, a couple months ago when they when they had that main event. So I think that I think this will be cool, and I agree with Desmond and Xavier. It's kind of like what what are we gonna do with this dude? Um, he's he has an opportunity to be a major major star for them. So I hope they they kind of figure it out. All right, so main event of the evening is uh, Madison Rain versus Tessa Blanchard. One thing that I think is cool is that when Impact puts the knockouts in the main event. They don't make a big deal about women empowerment and this revolution and evolution and whatever the hell. They they just they just deliver the women in the main event and that's it. It's not it's not this this big ass deal trying to play into social issues about uh, you know women and equal rights and everything. They just deliver. I actually thought this match was was good. I thought it was better than their first one. I like I actually like the way Madison won the match. Uh, Tessa shows a real legitimate mean streak out there. She's very strong, and you know Madison Rain has never been a strong striker. Like th- I hate those forearms that she does on the on the chest. Like they don't look like they can knock my son over. <laughs> and then you got Tessa just whooping her ass. But Tessa's so excellent, and you could tell Madison Rain's getting a little better. I shouldn't say she's getting better because she's a veteran, but the work she's done in Ring of Honor actually helped her um, to to do some new things. She 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 plays the hits a little bit, like she's got her little standard move set that always come out. But I thought the match overall was was good. I just I'm watching it the whole time though. I was like, no way Tessa loses this match. No way she loses twice. No way she has a 500 record. And she lost. So we're going to get to the post-match thing. But what did you think about this match in general and uh, Tessa losing again? Okay, well, let me go with the positive. I thought the match was better than the first match that they had, obviously. 
um, like I said, I can't say enough with Tessa. She just has that, <laughs> I had to use it, that it factor. So, you know, this was great. And Madison gets to win. I will say, man, like I've mentioned before, and I'm not down with the whole Madison Rain redemption tour. I think if you wanted to give her a title shot, you could have just ran a number one contenders multi-women match, let her win that and go along with it, and then just start building the feud between her and Sue Young. I didn't think this was the road to take to have her beat Tessa twice, and then as well as beat Taya, because those, you know, we like to believe are the up and coming knockouts or that they, they're going to be around for foreseeable future. So that just what kind of bothered me. And I guess, you know, if Tess is not under contract, you know, why are you going to push her to the moon? And then she goes and dare I say, leaves for that, whatever that competition is over there. So that's just what, what, what bothered me. And honestly, man, in, you know, before we get into the post-match, I would be shocked, shocked, if Su Young retains that slam anniversary at the rate that they're going and you just see, it seems like they're going the Gail Kim route with her truth be told. I, th- I think they're just going a route where they have to make us feel like Madison could win, but it may, it makes no sense for her to, I, I don't know. I, I've seen people agree with you on that. I don't think it makes any sense for her to win. I feel like they're just trying to make her feel like she's a credible opponent. If she's able to tug at our heartstrings a little bit, it'll make the Su Young victory matter even more instead of just being like a a random match the problem is madison rain has not mattered in a long time she's obviously kind of a legend of the knockouts division the beautiful people are legendary but the last couple years she was with impact she was just out there wrestling you know it's it's like um i'm trying to think of a, a parallel comparison um of someone on the roster right now who hasn't mattered it's kind of like uh, Andrew Everett didn't matter for the longest time, and, and that's like to say he's just going to show up one day and he's uh, he's challenging for the X Division title and they just start pushing it. You know, like it's just so out of left field. Even though they're throw- pushing it down our throats a, maybe a little, I think they're still doing a good job with, with building her. I just I don't see her winning. It makes no – I mean, they can't make Sue Young lose two pay-per-views in a row. Stranger things have happened. <laughs> yeah, like Tessa Blanchard losing twice to Madison Rain. <laughs> It, and you just if you look at it like you think about it this week. Well, okay, I, I guess a little bit last week too. That Su Young's barely started to become a focal point. You think about after she, you know, buried Ali alive. You didn't hear anything from Su Young, and Su Young's the champion. I thought that would have been a great opportunity to show some type of backstory with her, and they didn't capitalize on it. We just kind of went into the whole Madison Rain versus Tessa, just running through, you know, running through people. And, you know, so, but do you want to get into the post-match angle? Yeah, so after the match, Su Young comes out with her undead undead bridesmaid. So I'm glad that they're with her again. I was hoping that wasn't just a one-time thing. I hope they're they're kind of attached to her for the long run. I think that adds a lot to her character. She's so committed to to her character, man. I fucking love her. Um very committed the undead brides come out they circle the ring and rich swan talked about this on the teleconference he's like i'm gonna drop a little bit of a spoiler on you guys but so young is gonna come out with their bridesmaids and they're gonna be going around the ring and you're gonna hear the crowd start chanting this is awesome and he was talking about how powerful that is to have a character connect with the audience in that manner without saying a single word because you remember her debut um or when she showed up you know wasn't really a reaction for her now all of a sudden she gets a this is awesome chance so they add a lot the the bridesmaids and and um you know they circle the ring tessa gets the hell out of there and uh so they they start attacking ally and ally i mean not ally but madison ally makes the save so this is what's weird i thought ally was written off tv for longer than this I mean, she was put in a coffin. And usually when that happens, they're in any promotion. Um, they're usually written off for a little while. I can't speak for Lucha Underground. I know they do those those matches. But, um, yeah, did were you surprised that Ali showed up? Yes, and what I thought was, because I love the post-match beatdown where we first had Tessa, you know, just pummeling Madison. And then we had Sue Young come out with the Legion. I, I wanted to see the beatdown going on go on a little bit longer before you have the alley save. 
And I feel like, you know, there, it wasn't, it happened so quick. And yeah, like you said, I, I would have preferred personally, they end the show with Sue Young, uh, beating up Madison and delivering the panic switch. And then maybe you have Ali come in for the save on the next episode. I would have saved it, saved it for next episode versus this one. But yeah, it just it just seemed kind of just just random because we all believe that she had been buried. So, so I guess that one would assume now we're gonna get a tag tag team match between Ali and Madison versus Tessa and Sue Young. No, they um that's not the match we're getting. Um, but first of all, I want to say I thought they kind of had Madison in this role because they needed a baby face, but then Ali showed up. So, how come Ali doesn't get a rematch of the pay per view? That's where I was kind of like. All right, she escaped the coffin, but she came back more serious. You can see. I was happy to see her. No, the match for next week is actually Allie and uh, Madison Rain versus Sue Young and one of her bridesmaids. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that's badass. It's 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 uh billing it as her undead um undead maid of honor. Okay. So okay. I hope it's a tall, sexy one. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, the match graphic has Sue Young with all the bridesmaids. I wish they would have just taken a picture of the two of them. I thought that would have looked kind of cool, but I was actually hoping we were going to get a match where it was Sue Young, like, and all the bridesmaids versus like Madison and a few like random jobber knockouts or something, you know what I mean? From BCW or something like that. I, I kind of wanted to see like all of them, um, yeah. you know? Maybe like in an elimination match to where they eliminate all Madison's partners and then it's her against all them. Like I, I would have liked something like that, but I think it's pretty cool actually. Um, Sue Young and and her maid of honor uh, versus them. So I'm really curious who those bridesmaids are. It would be nice if maybe you know, and we've seen in wrestling sometimes where a wrestler debuts as part of a some type of stable and then later on once they break away they become their own character it'd be a nice way if like maybe somebody they've signed you know that i don't know who, who, if they've announced any recent signings but maybe someone they signed and hasn't debuted yet but they're using her right now as part of legion and then eventually she breaks away and you know is, becomes an addition to the knockouts but one would assume these are just enhancement local talent so eventually, once they decide to do away with it, then they're we won't see them again. I hope not. Like I really want them to stick around, but they um they look like the same group from Orlando. So I don't know. I was gonna say they could be Rise um, girls from Rise. So I don't know. S someone had said on my group chat, and I th actually thought the same thing that one of them looked like uh, Casey Spinelli at the time that it happened. But then when I saw the pictures after, I was like, ah, oh, maybe not. So I don't know. I'm, but I'm, I'm interested in the whole thing. I just, I love the Sue Young character. I, I don't get it when some people are like, oh, I don't, I don't like her. I'm like, she's fucking amazing. And maybe some people are just really uh, dedicated to Rosemary. You know what I mean? But Sue Young's freaking badass. The music, everything, love her. So, um, what do we got next week for matches? So then they announced that Katarina's returning to the ring. Killer Cross makes his in-ring debut. He actually cut a nice promo in here talking about his intention. So you're right, you're right. I'm interested to see what they do with him because, <laughs> you know, we already have one guy, I guess, technically undefeated. I wonder if that's the same route they're going to go with him. Then, obviously, we get Cage versus Congo Kong, and then we're getting Phoenix versus Rich Swan. Yeah, so apparently that one's supposed to be excellent. Phoenix wasn't at the last set of tapings. Um I want to say it was due to some kind of travel visa issue, um, but there was some reason he could not be in Orlando, but he was supposed to be. Uh, I know he did the pay-per-view, but he couldn't stay any longer than that. So I thought the episode was really solid. Um, I'm, I'm happy to see Katarina in the ring quickly. Uh, Killer Cross's debut should be cool. Cage versus Congo Kong, I think is going to be good. And uh, Phoenix Swan and Swan, like I said, it's supposed to be a classic. And then you got the tag team knockouts match so next week looks pretty uh pretty damn good but overall good episode i was very entertained by it um any uh closing thoughts or remarks on uh this week's show yeah i thought it was nice and i would just tell fellow impact fans don't let the ratings you know when we see the ratings not be favorable 
it's not so much a reflection as, you know, the product's bad. I mean, there's a lot of factors. And not that I'm trying to make excuses, up, but we just got to realize at the end of the day, you know, as long as we continue to support support it, I mean, things will, will look up. And they've been providing a solid programming and it's been easy to watch. So just got to keep it up, keep the faith. And, and the ratings don't matter in the sense of um, as long as these house shows continue to sell out, you know, uh, extra ratings aren't making them extra money, but we, we obviously want more eyes on a product. This, this rise of the knockouts one, I actually, um, plan on attending this. Uh, this is the one I'm very concerned is not going to be the sellout. Uh, rise is, looks like they're going out of business after this weekend, uh, the weekend, uh, working with impact. And I saw the writing on the wall for rise. I, I, really did i hope they're able to pull some kind of miracle out because i think it's a very good farm system for the knockouts but right now it's rumored that the the this rise of the knockouts is on a saturday and then they have a rise ascent taping the eighth and that's rumored to be it for rise so the ticket sales have been really bad for them uh the first couple rise shows were fine they were selling out they were setting records and they their intention with Rise of the Knockouts was to set a record <laughs> for attendance at a female show in, in Chicago, and uh, ticket sales have been pretty bad. So uh, let's hope it doesn't come across like that on Twitch. Uh, That's but, unfortunate. I mean, I, I've never really followed the product, but you know, I see it heavily promoted on Twitter. And, you know, you hate to see a business fold. I mean, I think the more companies, the better, especially with Impact having some of these partnerships it is given an opportunity for some of the wrestlers on from that promotion to appear on television, you know, and then it gives some of the impact stars to appear over there, maybe, you know, to hone their craft or whatever the case may be. So it's very unfortunate to hear. Yeah, it is. Um, I really did see the writing on the wall. I went to the the podcast that wrestles WrestleCon and there was only six of us in the crowd. Um, I just... The writing was on the wall. The owner has he spread himself way too thin, and I think that uh, hurt him quite a bit. I think he he was a one man show. I hope I hope they pull something out to save this company somehow. Um, you know the Patreon has eighteen patrons. You know it, it's it, the writing was just on the wall. The uh, Twitch channel doesn't seem to have a whole lot of action, um, even though they've tried to promote it. So, so let's hope. I really think it's it's a good farm system for the knockouts, and I think it was an excellent partnership. But we'll see what happens. And uh, yeah, I plan to be at Rise of the Knockouts. I'm about eighty percent sure that I will be there. Uh, it's a little bit of a drive for me, but I, want, I really want to go. So that's gonna do it for us uh, this week. I will be on again next week to talk Impact, and then uh, Adam will hop back on. So hope you guys enjoy the show. Please hit the subscribe button. This was kind of a long one this week. Apologies. Couldn't stop talking about the good product. So we'll talk to you guys soon. Peace.